Please welcome Associate Professor Cooper. The cause. Because that 90% didn't have a single gene involved, people thought, well, then it's not genetics, it must be the environment. And so we certainly have had situations where uh, you have head injuries, pesticide exposure. These are things that would increase your risk of Parkinson's. Not that you'll get it from playing rugby as a 14-year-old, but that they are things that would increase risk. Coffee is a great one because that actually decreases your risk of Parkinson's. So I diligently force it down as often as I can, and I hope that I'm saved there. Smoking also does, but you'll probably die from lung cancer before it will offer that advantage of uh, living longer. So I wouldn't recommend that. So we're left with this, oh, it must be environment and not much on the genes front. In reality, as in many cases in life, the truth is somewhere in between. And so we will have cases that are clearly a single gene that has a major disruption in some part of your brain, causing you degeneration to give you Parkinson's. But for most people, there's going to be a heavy genetic interaction, but also an environmental input. So we've got this blend of genetics laying a base and the environment that you might be exposed to then overlaying that and together giving you your risk of Parkinson's disease. So in today's modern language, when we call daunting problems, we use the word challenges like, you know, so here are the challenges we have with Parkinson's disease. We have no great objective test of who has Parkinson's disease. These are clinical symptoms of, do you have tremors? Do you have symptom X? Do you have symptom Y? How frequent are they? So really, it's quite difficult to say with any strong test, you have Parkinson's disease. Unlike a situation where you might be tested for your blood glucose level after fasting in the morning to see whether you have perhaps a type 2 diabetes, which Joe Greenford will be talking about later. So we don't have a test there. As I told you earlier, we also are diagnosing people way too late. The best time to try and alter the course of the disease is to detect it as early as possible. If we're not detecting you having Parkinson's till 60% through the disease course, then we're missing the opportunity to save those neurons from uh, being dysfunctional and perhaps really averting the course of the disease. We don't know the cause of the disease. Hard to avert it when we don't really know what's causing it. A lot of the symptoms, if you've ever heard of dopamine uh, replacement therapy for Parkinson's patients, it's treating the symptoms. It's not stopping the disease that will continue to further degenerate and basically progress to other regions of the brain. So we don't have anything that will stop or slow this, and we don't have a cure. It's depressing news, and that's why people like myself and others at the Garvin are working hard to try and address these issues. And so that's my lab and others here at the Garvin are looking at Parkinson's disease to try and address these. We're trying to find out if we can find objective tests for Parkinson's that will help us obviously with diagnosis. It will give us insights to the cause of the disease, which tells us perhaps how to treat it or slow its progression. So these are all aims that we're diligently working at. Well, at least I hope everyone in the lab is at the moment while I'm down here. So we start off with questions. Well, well I do. What's going wrong inside the neurons? Those brain cells inside your brain, neurons, what's going wrong inside them that causes them to no longer work properly or die? Now that then begs other questions. All right, well, if something's going wrong, can we identify what went wrong? And then can we identify what caused that to go wrong? In Guy's analogy with our car, we're driving along and uh, there's a problem, it won't move. We find out that basically, ah, the engine's not working. So there's, that's the situation. Then we'd like to know, why is my engine not working? What went wrong with it? Can I try and stop that? Can I detect it earlier on before the engine fails and leaves me on the middle of a highway at night? So these are part of why we're taking these approaches. Third part is that, and this is just a quick oversight, is that it's not just that the part of the brain with this disease gets worse, other regions of the brain start to degenerate during the, the course of Parkinson's disease. So the coloration, the darker it is of this brain, is showing you in just a sort of cartoon-like manner the first regions that start to degenerate. Then the next light, so here would be have our first area of degeneration. The next shading shows the next region of the brain that would degenerate. And these arrows are to go that basically you get different regions. So that's disease progression to affect different regions of the brain. And that's why symptoms appear further along in the course of the disease. 
But that's why another important thing is, how does this disease progress? What's the relationship there? Maybe we see you here when you've got it with this symptoms, but could we stop it appearing in other regions? So these are what sort of drive us. If we can find out the cause, hey, what caused our engine to fail in the car? Then that allows us to look for those signs early on and get an earlier diagnosis. So that's really critical. If we can identify what causes these things, then we can find out they're the canary in the mine. Let's look for that somehow in the body so we can see people much earlier. If we can also see what causes them and really what's going wrong, then that says, hey, this is what's going wrong. Focus on this. Any cell has got a lot of things going on in it. If you can, and it's a lot of things. So if you can pay if your attention drag to go look over here, that's what's going wrong. That's what's going wrong first. Try and think of how you can prevent that happening or stop it getting worse. That will stop the whole cascade of dysfunction that's gonna go on in the cell. As I spoke about the disease progression, if we can understand what's involved and why these other regions at later time points of the disease start to degenerate, then maybe we can basically, even though you might have had failure here, we could perhaps prevent other regions of the brain and the symptoms that are dementia, et cetera, that more obviously worsen one people, people's quality of life tremendously. So these are the sort of questions that drive us to look at this stuff. Where to start? Great question. That's why I wrote it. <laughs> Me, it was, look, what do we know about these 90% of people who get Parkinson's that don't have a single gene? It's just this thing like, it's idiopathic is a polite word of saying unknown cause. What we do know from genetic studies is that there are hints throughout the, your genome of what's going, that may contribute to the disease or increase your risk of it. So we took an approach to try and find what are all the genes in, in Parkinson's disease that might have slight changes or alterations that may put you at increased risk for developing Parkinson's. And so if we undertake this approach, this will help us in a lot of these layers that I've listed here, but really this is, can we find all the genes? Not just try and find one and basically, so imagine this is a jigsaw, okay? There's no pictures, there's no pictures on the jigsaw, so you've just got pieces that are blank. Even everyone's sky, how's that? There's no box with a picture to go, I know where this piece goes. You're just walking around with a piece going, I wonder how this fits. What we want to find out is at a minimum is, can we at least know that we have all the pieces so we can put those together rather than just have one piece going, this could be something. So part of this is that we wanted to start off with identifying all the genes as I just showed you, those pieces of puzzles. And that would then help us to understand, perhaps addressing this question, what's going wrong? Because if we find the genes that are involved, we know in some cases what they do, and that grabs our attention to say, hmm, look at this system in the cell. Is that maybe what's going wrong? So to address what's going wrong inside these neurons, we use a whole bunch of things and approaches. I'm not gonna go into detail about this, but we'll use anything from using human brains that have been donated uh, post-mortem, uh, mice, primary neurons, cultured cells, yeast. We take a huge approach in the hope that, that all of those will come together and, and indicate we're on the right track, which it has. And so here's basically from doing this analysis to what's going wrong in the, in the neurons, we're left with a situation, and this is obviously highly cartoon version, is that some puzzles that have some components that we know are contributing to Parkinson's disease and why those neurons fail. And so what we're doing is gathering data using this type of approach and many others to try and see, can we see relationships here? Because if you've got two pieces of the puzzle that click together, like if you've ever done jigsaw puzzle and you hear that nice snapping noise, you know that's a correct fit. That for us is a sign we're on the right track because those pieces don't snap together by themselves. It's only if they really do. So we've had some exciting work in the lab recently, snapping these two very different pieces together mitochondrial problems, I won't go into details what they are, and another protein called alpha synuclein, each have been known to contribute to Parkinson's disease, but now we've brought together that they actually are interacting with each other and contributing to perhaps causing this much, this dysregulation and loss of function of those neurons. We also have, so that's basically what might be going wrong in the cells, but what causes those things to go wrong? Well, as Guy has spoken about the tremendous advances of our sequencing capacity to understand changes in your genome, there have been a lot of genetic studies that have identified what regions, they're just representing all your different chromosomes, not yours personally, but uh, human chromosomes, and the red bands represent regions of those chromosomes, 
that there have been changes associated with that suggest that something's different there that might contribute to Parkinson's disease. So these are studying tens of thousands of individuals. What we've taken then is to rather than just another way of asking what's changed is to take a, a number of patients and control groups because you're always comparing them and asking what's different about these parts of the chromosome and the RNA that they encode in patients versus people who do not have Parkinson's but of a similar age. And that's given us a lot of clues. We're halfway through that using a lot of the genomic sequencing facility that the Garvin and the Kinghorn now has. And that is to identify what is different. It's another way to ask, can I understand what is different between these? Because then I can find out what's going wrong and at different stages of the disease, what are those early events? So we've been doing a lot of that and it's uh, already finding a lot of uh, fruition for us that one of the genes and regions of the chromosome that's highly associated with Parkinson's encodes a specific uh, molecule that looks like it regulates 60 other genes, some of which are intimately involved in Parkinson's. So we're very excited about this, uh, this transcript, as I'll call it, because basically it is, looks like it is, it is certainly down five-fold, or it's 80% lower in people who have Parkinson's in their brains, the ones we've studied to date, compared to healthy people of a similar age. And we really think it could be a major regulator. Now, we're at this, two things that we could do with this information. One is which, if we think it's going down early on in patients, then maybe it could be a diagnostic test. Now, we can't ask people in the GP when you turn 40, could we have a sample of your brain, as, as Guy talked about. There's a bit of pushback from the consumer with that request. Yeah. And that is, so could we take a sample of your brain, measure the level of this molecule we call stubby, and ask, is it down? If it is, you're at risk, and we're going to perhaps give you some therapy or really monitor you closely. We can't do that. So what we're doing is doing blood tests to see whether, even though it's a change in the brain, are we fortunate enough that the cells in your blood are also reflecting that diminished or reduced expression of stubby? And so we're getting samples from St. Vincent's Hospital from a large number of Parkinson's patients, measuring the level of stubby in the patient's blood. What we need is a reference group of people who are healthy of a similar age. What we would hope to see is that the healthy people have this much stubby and the patients have much less, and that we can see that difference. That would be a huge step to be able to say, look, if we measure stability in people's brains, uh, blood at 40, that's an indicator or biomarker for the disease. So this handsome devil here is hoping to ask you, anyone in the audience, uh, if that you're willing to donate two teaspoons of blood, uh, either later today after it's ended, or at least be in touch with us to schedule an appointment. We're looking for healthy individuals of a similar age as Parkinson's patients, so 55 and above is sort of our main target group, that basically could be able to give blood so we can use those people as a reference to see how, what's the level in healthy people and compare them to the level in Parkinson's patients to see if this is a viable option. This discovery isn't just about biomarker because if this level is down five-fold, it gives us a long-term approach, not tomorrow. It's always tomorrow, it seems. I know what that feels like. So basically, could we boost expression of this in the brain and bring that level back up to where it should be? Could that be a potential therapy? So we also have, how could we stop progression? How could we stop those regions moving on to the next part? And so that's another part of the research we're doing. We're trying to address all of these situations here. And so a protein that I won't go into a lot about, it's called alpha-synuclein, and it's quite central to Parkinson's disease. And what you can see is that people who have Parkinson's disease have made quite a lot more of this protein this neuron in their neurons, and it contributes to those neurons dying. We're still trying to ask out exactly how it does that, but we do know that elevated levels is, is involved in this process. So where basically here is my stylized hexagon neuron, which is not at all the shape, it's just a shape to show you. And this is the normal level, let's say, uh, these representing a molecule of alpha-synuclein. What might happen is that the cell, for reasons we're still investigating, starts to inappropriately make more alpha-synuclein. And then eventually, it reaches a form where they all coalesce and form this quite toxic uh, structure, hence indicated by uh, the skull and crossbone. So causing the neuron to die and fail. It's all about the level of alpha-synuclein in these neurons as one aspect. So what we're looking at is that here is our bucket. Here's the tap making alpha-synuclein. Here's a hole in the bottom dripping out, representing as the neuron naturally degrades and destroys or disposes of alpha-synuclein. 
So if this is a bucket that's half full of alpha synuclein, and that's the correct level you want in your neuron, anything that makes that bucket fill up with more alpha synuclein is going to be a problem and may contribute to Parkinson's disease. And that could happen in two ways. Either we turn on the tap faster and we increase alpha synuclein, or we pinch shut the drain, which is responsible for degrading and getting rid of that. Either more making more synuclein or degrading less will cause that water level to rise and maybe cause us this high level, which will give us this ugly problem. So we're looking at any ways we're trying to understand this process and can we use it as a potential therapy? Because one of the things could be if we can reduce uh, production of alpha synuclein, so maybe there's some problem, we're now making more alpha synuclein and that bucket level fills up to dangerous levels of synuclein in the neuron, if we could reduce through a therapeutic approach to make less alpha synuclein, maybe we can return that bucket to its natural level and, and avoid the problems. So that's, could we cause the cell to make less alpha synuclein? The reciprocal approach is that, could we accelerate the degradation, open that drain up so it drains faster and the level drops? So here we have, again, this high level of alpha synuclein in our neuron. If we could increase alpha synuclein degradation in those neurons, we could drop that level back down to a healthy level. The second one is, we're doing both, but this one's a lot of research we're doing at the moment in our lab. And that is where we have mice as our models that uh, can make elevated levels of synuclein and produce PD-like symptoms. And then we have this gene we've discovered called PARC9. It's a Parkinson's gene, and usually it's a loss of function that may contribute to the disease. We have data in cell culture models that if you overexpress this, it basically reduces the amount of alpha synuclein and the cells are much healthier because they've returned that bucket to its natural level. We're now basically testing these in mice with the support of Michael J. Fox Foundation, uh, an international funding body for Parkinson's research. Can we boost PARC9 expression in these mice and restore them to that? Am I going for time and finish up? Yep. Got time or finish up? Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> You've got time to finish up. <laughs> that's fine. I'll stop. I'll, I'll, I'll bypass that because that'll take a little longer. And really, we're doing a, a wide range of research in the Garvin on Parkinson's disease, as are several other labs. And I really want to draw attention to not just the Garvin and the Australian Federation, uh, Federal Government support and Michael J. Fox, but the Garvin Foundation. Basically, when we come up with ideas, and scientists have a lot of good ideas, we have to basically get some data to show that there's more than just a principle on paper. The Federal Government will support us when we have quite a bit of data to convince them. The difficulty is doing the research to get those first experiments that say, yep, this idea is working, it's got real promise. That's where the Garvin Foundation is really special and with your support has been able to fund these um, starting experiments or starting projects to get it over that first hump and basically then allow us to really run with it and ask for larger amounts of money and, and, and uh, leverage that. So that's been excellent. And just lastly, if anyone is interested in this, uh, we have a, a very short questionnaire, which would just see, you know, like, are you matching on the profiles of not being anything to do with symptoms of Parkinson's disease? We're not suggesting it's a diagnosis at all. And if you're interested, uh, find me or Sarah, who will be here. We'll have at, at, um, at morning tea, which is next, I believe, and also afterwards. If you look for either me or Sarah, who will have one of these green folders, you can talk to us about whether you might be able to donate blood today after this meeting or at least leave us your name and information and we can contact you for later scheduling for uh, acting as a critical reference group that we're interested. So thank you for your time. <laughs>